All right, it's two o'clock, so we're gonna get going. I'm sure we'll have a bunch of people jumping on as we get going here, um, but we like to run right on time. So uh, my name is Tiffany Shag. I am a dietitian here at TB12 Sports. Really excited for today's webinar on sleep and recovery. Um, a few uh, housekeeping before we get going. Um, on Zoom, in the bottom left-hand corner is your mute button. If everyone can just take a second and make sure that that is on, just out of respect for everyone else on the, uh, on the, on the call, um, just make sure that mute button is on. The other thing is we will be using the chat, uh, way, the chat button to communicate. So um, if you have questions throughout Dr. Bender's talk, please feel free to use that chat uh, button. It is at the bottom of your screen, right in the center. Just click on that and you'll see a, a little window open up. That's how you'll submit questions. I will be kind of taking care of those as, as we go through. And then at the very end, we'll get to as many questions as we, as we possibly can. So um, just be aware of that chat section. Um, okay, so so sleep. Um, Dr. Amy Bender is our guest here. Um, really excited. I learned about Dr. Bender uh, a few years ago when doing my own research in sleep. She has been my go-to source since. I highly recommend making her your go-to source. Um, her Twitter handle is sleep, the number four, sport. Um, so if you ever need any questions, anything on sleep, make her your go-to source. She's a, a wealth of knowledge. Um, She's a senior research scientist at Calgary Counseling Center and an adjunct assistant professor of kinesiology at the University of Calgary. She received her PhD and Master of Science degrees in experimental psychology from Washington State University, specializing in sleep EEG. Uh, she helped develop the only validated sleep screening tool for athletes and has implemented sleep optimization strategies for numerous Canadian Olympic and professional teams. Uh, her current areas of focus or on how sleep and exercise interventions can improve mental health outcomes. She was a for former collegiate basketball player, completed an Ironman, no joke, in 2009, and currently chases around her three young kids, which I imagine is the most exhausting part of all the things she does. Without further ado, Dr. Bender. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. You can hear me okay? All right. So uh, I just wanna thank TB12 for hosting this workshop today. There are a number of online questions that came in over the weekend uh, that I've done my best to address in the presentation. I also wanted to mention that I don't want the information from this presentation to cause more anxiety about your sleep. So if you are currently struggling to get a good night's sleep, um, you know, sleep is, is an interesting process because the more you worry about it, the more it becomes elusive. So I'm hoping this presentation will nudge those who aren't prioritizing sleep enough to do so. And for those who are really struggling to try not to solve it on your own, but instead seek help from a sleep professional. All right, so now that I have that disclaimer out of the way, the first thing I want, want you to know about sleep is that a good night's sleep starts from the moment you wake up. So it's not just about what you're doing in the 30 minutes before bedtime, but what you do across the day that can make a difference. And that brings me to this picture here. So this is me chilling near the top of a mountain at Chester Lake in Alberta, Canada which I might add is only about an hour and a half from my house. So I feel really lucky to have the Canadian Rockies basically in my backyard. And on this particular day, I ended up getting a really good night's sleep. So to start it off um, in the chat box, I'd like people to put in a couple of ideas on what factors from this picture could have been related to my good night's sleep. So go ahead and type those ideas into the chat box. I have uh, three, three major ideas that I'm trying to uh, hit on here that probably help me in my good night's sleep. Okay, so a couple people mentioned exercise. Um, absolutely, exercise usually leads to better sleep for just the everyday individual, for um, people with insomnia, people with sleep disorders, generally see that exercise leads to deeper sleep and typically makes it easier for you to fall asleep and stay asleep. 
I noticed uh, someone put in the chat box, a couple people put in sunlight, exposure to light. So that's a key component to good quality sleep. We know that light is the most potent regulator of our circadian rhythms, which helps us know when to be awake and when to be asleep. And when we're looking at uh, outdoor lighting, it can be as much as 500 times brighter than indoor lighting. So even on a cloudy day, we're looking at five to 10 times brighter than our indoor lighting. So getting lots of light exposure, sunlight outside, especially in the morning, is going to lead to better sleep quality. And I think a few people put mindfulness being outside. Uh, the third factor I wanted to touch on was um, being in nature. So I'm currently reading, I don't know if anyone's read the book, The Nature Fix by Florence Williams. It's an absolute fascinating book about how nature can help our mental and physical health. And in there, she talks about the many ways nature activates our parasympathetic nervous system, our relaxation system that's important in preparing us for sleep. So again, the point of this picture is to demonstrate that a good night's sleep starts with the moment that you wake up. So presentation outline, um, the first, there's actually, the first two points that I'm gonna discuss in part one is the science of sleep, as well as busting some sleep myths that are out there. And then in part two, I'm gonna get into uh, tips to help you sleep well. As far as uh, learning objectives, at the end of this presentation, learners will be able to identify what good sleep is. So in the quantity of sleep, quality of sleep and timing of sleep, as well as be able to dispel some common sleep myths and then apply sleep strategies to your own routine. So um, we know exercise is important. We know nutrition is important. We know sleep is important, but how do we actually apply that information to our own routine? So I'm gonna to touch on that at the end where I'm talking about the sleep tips. Let's start off with a riddle. So this naturally occurring performance enhancer has been proven to improve mood and decision making, boost alertness, reduce injury risk, protect immunity, and help build and repair tissues. It costs nothing and is freely available. What is it? When I give this talk to nutritionists, the, some of, I've heard people shout out um, vitamin D. <laughs> so um, it's actually vitamin Z. So it's pretty incredible that one of the biggest performance enhancers out there is freely available and costs nothing. Yet so many people ignore the benefits. They think sleep is a waste of time. It's unproductive. But I think this is furthest from the truth. So I'm hoping this talk will try and convince you otherwise. Why do we actually sleep? Well, we don't really know the answer to this, and many sleep scientists debate this question, and yet there's no real consensus as to why we actually sleep. But I really like this quote from sleep scientist pioneer Dr. Alan Rechtschafen, who pointed out nicely that if sleep does not serve an absolute vital function, then it is the biggest mistake the evolutionary process ever made. So we spend about a third of our lives sleeping, which is a huge amount of time to be vulnerable to predators, not gathering food, not reproducing. So there must be an important function of sleep. And although we debate why we sleep, most of the theories have to do with restoring the brain and the body from wakefulness. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the research on sleep and how it could be sabotaging your health goals if you aren't prioritizing it. I first wanted to talk about sleep loss and physical health. Um, sleep loss and potentially to some extent, I would say long sleep has been linked with numerous chronic diseases, including obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, 
cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and even quicker mortality. Um, you know, many of these studies are looking at associations, so they may find that short sleepers also have these diseases, but it's unclear which causes which. But I wanted to um, throw out one yearly example that happens to all of us, a yearly example of sleep loss that nearly all of us are familiar with that can pinpoint a little bit better what sleep loss can do to our physical health. So does anyone have any ideas what this yearly one hour of, there you go, daylight saving time. Um, here, this is where we set our clocks ahead. We lose an hour of sleep um, and we have a slight mismatch with our circadian rhythms, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But what we find in the research is that the Monday after daylight saving time switch, there is a 24% increase in heart attacks. So this is, this is huge and it's definitely linked to the circadian misalignment as well as that one hour of sleep loss. I wanted to talk about uh, sleep and mental health as well. So there are many mental health symptoms impacted by sleep. In the interest of time, I'm gonna focus on depression, which is one of the most common mental health problems. And uh, every year at Calgary Counseling Center, we run a depression awareness campaign to reduce stigma surrounding depression. And what we do is we put out this survey, we, we get participants from all across the world taking the survey to see if they need to get further evaluation for depression. And so last year we had almost 17,000 people from 115 different countries take the survey and we looked at how their depression score related to the amount of sleep that they're getting. Let me show you that graph. Well, what we found was that 64% of the sample were recommended for further depression evaluation. This is quite high. It may be, it's probably a sampling bias in that those people who are more likely to have depression probably took this survey when we compare that to the general population. But when we're looking at the sleep, we found that um, those with, and let me go to my graph here, so those with shorter sleep, so we have hours of sleep per night along the bottom here, and then we have the depression score along the vertical axis with higher levels of depression at the top and lower levels at the bottom. And what we found is when we compared their depression scores to the amount of sleep that they were getting, we found that both uh, short sleepers and long sleepers were associated with higher depression levels. And when we looked at those individuals who were recommend, recommended for further depression evaluation, we found that about 70% um, weren't me meeting the recommendations of seven to nine hours of sleep per night. So about 66% of those were getting less than seven hours per sleep. And then about 3% of those were getting more than nine hours of sleep who were recommended for depression evaluation. So we know there is a strong relationship between depression and sleep. Uh, we also found that the sweet spot for this was right around seven and a half hours was associated with the lowest depression score. Let's take a look at the research surrounding sleep loss and mental processes. So I just highlighted two studies here. So this particular study was looking at a week of five hours of sleep per night. And they found, and they compared that to a group who was getting about eight hours of sleep. And they found, they gave them a decision-making task and found that the sleep-deprived group took more risks without even realizing it. And in this study, the, the authors noted that uh, we therefore do not notice that we are acting riskier when suffering from a lack of sleep. So it was almost a disconnect. We're making riskier decisions, but we aren't aware that we are making those riskier decisions. Um, and then I wanted to highlight this study too, where they found that after 20 hours without sleep, 
reaction time was similar to being legally drunk. So what they did in this study is they compared um, the same group who were sleep deprived and they were looking at their reaction time um, when they were sleep deprived versus when they were drinking alcohol. And they found that after about 20 hours, which is the equivalent of about four in the morning, patients or the participants had reactions times equivalent to being legally drunk. Nutrition is a pillar of our health. I know it's a big part of the TB12 program. So I wanted to also touch on sleep loss and how that impacts nutrition. Um, here we have, we know that sleep loss impacts our appetite hormones. So we'll typically see a reduction in leptin, which is that feeling of full. We see an increase in ghrelin, which is that feeling of being hungry. Um, or related to being hungry. And then in this particular study, they found an increase in hunger and appetite by 25% with just two nights of sleep loss um, where participants were getting four and a half hours of sleep. And it led to these changes in the appetite hormones. It also impacts food choices. So there's studies that have shown that you crave more fats you crave more carbs, you eat more carbs, you eat less fruits and vegetables, and there's more snacking that particularly occurs during, um, towards the end of the night, right before bedtime, we see a lot more snacking occurring. And we know, um, we know sleep loss, there is a deactivation of the prefrontal cortex, which is our high level decision making area. And there's an increase in the brain activity related to impulsivity. So I think that this change in brain activity coupled with or our appetite hormonal changes could lead us to change our food choices for the worst. And there was a study looking at, a meta-analysis looking at 11 different studies and they kind of averaged the amount of extra calories consumed and they found that it was about 400, an increase of 400 calories consumed with uh, when they were looking at sleep restricted studies of about three and a half to five and a half hours of sleep. They found an increase of about 400 calories consumed. Bottom line, you know, all of these changes are occurring but um, all of these can lead to more calories being consumed. Sleep and immunity, it's a very relevant topic during these days. So I wanted to highlight uh, one study in particular talking about sleep and immunity. And what we generally find is when the amount of sleep goes down, the inflammation goes up. Basic um, understanding of that. So I'll highlight this study here. This was a study done in 164 individuals where they were looking at their sleep about a week prior to exposure to the cold virus, so the rhinovirus. And what they found in this study was that the greater the amount of sleep the person got, so those who are getting seven hours or more, the less likely they were to catch a cold when exposed to the virus. So those who are getting greater than seven hours here, they had a 17% chance of catching that cold when exposed to the virus versus those who are getting less than five hours had about a 45% chance of catching that cold, showing that um, the more sleep you get, the less likely you are to catch a cold and the less sleep, less sleep you get, the higher chances of catching that cold when you're exposed to that cold virus. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit more about the science of sleep and what actually is going on when we sleep. So if you're lucky, you hit the pillow, you wake up seven to eight hours later, but while you're laying there, a lot has gone on. In fact, during sleep, some parts of the brain are actually more active than when we are awake. And the gold standard way that we measure sleep is through the electroencephalography, so the EEG, which is looking at the electrical activity of the brain. 
Um, and sleep is divided into two main parts. So we have non-rapid eye movement sleep or non-REM sleep, as well as rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. So we're gonna look at a picture of what that looks like, um, potentially what that would look like when you're sleeping, a uh, picture of the brain. So here we have the first stage of sleep. So we'll fall into this non-REM stage one stage of sleep. Uh, this is our lightest stage of sleep. It takes up about 5% of our total sleep time, oops, sorry, um, across the night. And this stage is when we're, it's when we're transitioning from wake to sleep. Our eye movements slow down, our muscles start to relax, and you may even flinch as you're falling asleep during this stage. Then we move into stage two sleep. So this is the most common stage of sleep. It takes up about 50% of our sleep time across the night. Breathing and heart rate become regular, body temperature drops, and we start to see K complexes. So these kind of larger waves during this stage, as well as we'll see some sleep spindles occurring as well. Um, and these, this is important to, the sleep spindles are important to protect the sleeper from external noises. So the more frequent the spindles someone has, the less the person wakes up during the night and the better the memory that person is having. And then after stage two sleep, we go into the deepest stage of non-REM sleep. So this is stage three, so N3. And this takes up about 20% of our sleep time across the night. It typically occurs in the first half of the night. So within the first four hours or so, we will see a little bit of deep sleep towards the end of the night at some, in some individuals. But generally that's occurring in the first half of the night. And we see very large brain waves occurring during this stage. This is where tissues are being repaired, growth hormone is being released, and it's also highly involved in memory consolidation. As we age, we actually see a decrease in the amount of deep sleep that we're getting. Um, and so finding ways to um, increase that deep sleep is important. So exercise is important at boosting that deep sleep, as well as there's been some new research looking at acoustic stimulation, which is sound to help um, increase the amount of deep sleep people are getting. And they've done studies in Alzheimer's patients, people with memory problems, and they're finding that it is helping with their cognitive decline. So after stage, after that deepest stage of sleep, we'll typically go into back into non-REM stage two. And then after about 90 minutes, we'll get into REM sleep. So this is where we are actively dreaming, although we can, we can dream in any stage of sleep. This stage takes up approximately 25% of your sleep time and around 90 minutes from the time you fall asleep to get into this stage. And I think what people need to be aware of, this is also highly involved in memories as well and integrating new memories with past experiences to help solve problems and gain insights. And I just wanted to show, I guess, a better picture of kind of what your, how these stages uh, distribute across the night. So this is a hypnogram. It helps depict how the stages of sleep progress across the night. And so from this picture, you can see we start off uh, being, being awake for a short period. And this is a cartoon. So this is a very clean picture of what it actually looks like. Um, so in this particular instance, uh, was awake for a short period, went into stage one, had a little bit of stage one sleep, was into stage two here, and then went into the deepest stage of sleep, stage three, non-REM stage three. After that stage three, they went back up into stage two, and then after about 90 minutes had that first REM period. So as you can see from this, we have a uh, cycle one, so it goes from non-REM to REM sleep, and then cycle two would be from the next non-REM period to the REM uh, sleep there. And what we generally see is much of that uh, deep stage of sleep is occurring in the first half of the night, whereas a lot of the REM sleep is occurring in the last half of the night. So generally, I would say that deep sleep is protected, 
But um, if you're cutting your sleep short, you're probably impacting the amount of REM sleep that you're getting because of the likelihood of REM sleep to occur towards the end of the night. Generally, we go through about four to six sleep cycles per night um, when we're talking about those non-REM sleep non-REM to REM sleep cycles. And I have a video here. So this was a video put on by actually one of my old uh, lab mates at Washington State University uh, put this video together. And it's really great to look at the two processes that regulate our sleep. So I'm going to start that. How does our body know when to be awake and when to be asleep? We spend around one third of our lives sleeping, but being able to sleep well is actually quite a complicated process. Scientists therefore developed the two process model of sleep regulation to help explain how sleep and wake are controlled. According to this model, two processes regulate our sleep wake pattern. The first process called process S refers to the build of sleep pressure. This pressure to sleep builds up during wakefulness and then decreases as we sleep. For most people, being awake for 16 hours will build up enough sleep pressure to be able to fall asleep and stay asleep for around eight hours. Another way to think about process S is to liken it to hunger. The longer we go without food, the hungrier we get. But once we eat a big meal, we need to wait a while until we're hungry again. Process S is homeostatic, meaning we can only go so long without sleep before our sleep pressure builds up so high that we can't maintain wakefulness. Like when you stay up really late to watch a movie, but fall asleep during it. Other times, behaviours like napping or sleeping in can reduce our sleep pressure and make it more difficult to fall asleep at night. So process S explains sleep pressure, but how does our body know to sleep at night? The second process, process C, is... Oh, sorry about that. ...responsible for the timing of sleep. Process C refers to our circadian rhythm, which is a 24-hour cycle that oscillates like a sine wave. There are many important bodily processes that follow this 24-hour cycle, including body temperature, digestion, and hormone production. For example, our brain produces melatonin at night when it's dark, but suppresses melatonin production in the morning and throughout the day, whilst it's light. Process S and Process C work independently, but we get the best sleep when they're working together with a constant push and pull between them. Unfortunately, there are times when the two processes get out of sync, and this can often lead to disrupted sleep. For example, if you work the night shift and have been awake for 24 hours, you may fall asleep quickly, only to be woken by your body clock a few hours later. In other words, Process S is ready to go to sleep, but Process C wants to be awake. This phenomenon also explains jet lag, with our body clock not quite adjusting to the new time zone, despite us being awake for many hours in transit. So there you have the two process model of sleep regulation. Whilst it doesn't explain everything about sleep weight regulation, it's a really useful conceptual model that allows us to understand how process S and process C work together to help get you a good night's sleep. I'll just go back to the picture here. Um, it, it's a bit complicated and actually took me a little while to figure this out, but I wanted to give you an example to try and explain the, these two processes working together. So during my graduate work, I worked on a study where we sleep deprived individuals for 62 hours. So this is two full nights without sleep. And what I noticed for myself was that on hour 60, um, one, of my, one of my tasks was to hook up the participants with electrodes so that we could measure their brain waves during the night. And you know, this process occurred about 8 p.m. This is hour 60 prior to them going to sleep at 10 p.m. And they were fine staying awake. It was so odd to me that after being sleep deprived for 60 hours, that they were still able to maintain wakefulness and stay awake. And this was because of their circadian rhythms and their um, regulation of that alertness and drowsiness throughout the day. And when I compared that to hour 20, where it's 4 a.m. in the morning 
they've been sleep deprived for 20 hours, they had a horrible time staying awake when their melatonin was very high. And so this kind of example made me realize that it's not just about how long you've been awake, but also where you're at within your circadian cycle of alertness. Sleep might regulate. All right, so now that you're all trained up on how to um, score sleep, look at that EEG, uh, I wanted to get into the three key ingredients for a good night's rest. So these three factors are very important. Um, and the first factor that we're gonna discuss is sleep quantity. So I actually have a, a poll for you, to uh, for you to take. So Tiffany, if you wanna uh, start the poll for the amount of sleep people are getting. So go ahead and uh, take your time, read that question, let us know how much, how many hours of actual sleep did, did you get at night during the past month? And then click that answer choice and then submit it. Okay, now Tiffany's gonna show us the results here from that poll and we'll take a look to see how much sleep are you all getting? So here, okay, so it looks like 15% um, of the people on the webinar right now are getting less than five to six hours of sleep per night. We have about 35% getting between six to seven and then 39%, seven to eight, so that's our leader there. And then 13%, um, eight to nine, and then we have one, uh, one or two people getting between nine to 10 hours. So I wanted to talk about, um, so here we have about, I guess 50% of the sample tuning into this workshop are not meeting the recommendations for the amount of sleep that they should be getting. So I'm really hoping to um, nudge those individuals to prioritize sleep, but it may also be an issue of a sleeping disorder, such as insomnia that's limiting, limiting them from getting the amount of sleep that they need. So I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about that to hope, hope that people can really try and aim for that minimum of seven hours. So let's talk about quantity. So how much sleep should we be getting? I mentioned the um, seven to nine hours. So let's take a look at that. Uh, so we have our first myth here. So the first myth is everyone needs eight hours of sleep. So let's take a deeper look at that. Uh, this is a this is a graph by the National Sleep Foundation that has ages along the bottom and then the amount of sleep along the vertical axis. And what we're looking at for each of these ages is the recommendation is that dark blue color for all of these ages. So if we look at a school age child between the ages of six and 13 years of age, we're looking at between nine and 11 hours is the recommended amount. Then when we move to a teenager between eight and 10, and then adults generally need about seven to nine hours. So this dark blue is the recommended amount. The teal, it may be appropriate in those instances. But let's take a look at uh, elite athletes. So this was a bit of an old slide. Um, I apologize for not including uh, Tom Brady in here who does get between nine and 10 hours of sleep and often goes to bed really early before 9 p.m. Um, but this is a bit of an older infographic that I got off the internet and I'm working on updating that. But we see a number of elite athletes along the bottom and then the amount of sleep that they're reporting to get across a 24 hour day with the white line being six hours and 45 minutes. And what we generally see is that most of these athletes are getting far above that uh, white line there with athletes such as Roger Federer reporting between 11 and 12. We have Usain Bolt, eight to 10, LeBron James, 12 hours, Michelle Wee, 10 to 12 hours. And then we have Tiger Woods here 
getting between four to five hours, which um, I'm going to refrain from making any jokes about that. But um, this was also in 2011 when his performance started to tank. So that may be uh, related to his sleep duration. So we see, again, most athletes are prioritizing sleep because of the benefits. A lot of professional teams are using sleep scientists to help with help their athletes get more sleep, help optimize sleep with the crazy schedules that they have. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, we need to keep this in mind. These athletes are really prioritizing sleep. We know that it's probably likely that athletes need more sleep to recover from the mental and physical demands of the sport. And so I'm hoping this might motivate you to um, but I think for the everyday person, getting 10 hours of sleep is probably too much sleep. So you don't want to maybe go all out like they're doing. But um, really, these athletes, they depend on performance and they're really taking sleep seriously. So another myth that I hear a lot is I'm fine on little sleep. I'm probably just a short sleeper. I can definitely get by on little sleep. You know, I probably don't need as much sleep. But uh, what we know from the research is that we don't actually think that we can adapt to chronic sleep loss. And I'm talking years and years and years of chronic sleep loss here and reduce the amount of sleep that we need. So generally we think that sleep need is pretty stable. Um, but what actually happens when you get less sleep is you become poor at recognizing when you're sleep deprived. So research has shown time and time again that you're a terrible judge of your performance when you are sleep deprived. Subjects and studies overreport how well they're, they're performing. So if you think you're a short sleeper, chance, the chances of that are probably very low. Uh, one recent study discovered the first gene linked to a father-son duo who were getting between four and five hours of sleep per night, waking up refreshed, had no memory impairments. And when the scientists actually looked to see how common this was, it was actually less than one in four million people had this gene mutation. So the bottom line is the likelihood that this is you is probably pretty slim. And even if you think you're doing well on little sleep, it's likely that you're overrating your performance. So we talked about quantity of sleep. Let's talk about quality now. So um, Tiffany's going to pull up the question for quality of sleep and how satisfied you are with your sleep quality. So go ahead and fill that out. Okay, so if we look at the results from that question, looks like, um, again, we see about 49% are dissatisfied with the quality of their sleep. We have about 8% who are neutral on this, and then we have 44% who are somewhat satisfied or, or very satisfied with their sleep quality. And this, this question is taken directly from the Athlete Sleep Screening Questionnaire, which is a questionnaire I helped develop. Um, and it, it was one of the biggest predictors for uh, sleep disturbance. And so this is a really important question for you to gauge, to kind of judge how well you're sleeping is this question right here. So um, definitely need some work on that with those people who are, are dissatisfied. So let's talk about quality. So what is good quality sleep? Well, the National Sleep Foundation defines us as falling asleep in less than 30 minutes, waking up no more than once per night, being awake for 20 minutes or less during the night after initially falling asleep, and sleeping 85% of the time while you're in bed. So let's kind of take a look at an example of what this might look like. 
This would be someone who maybe goes to bed at 11 p.m. They fall asleep at 11.20 p.m. So they're falling asleep in less than 30 minutes. They wake up once during the night at 3 a.m. to use the bathroom, but they're able to fall asleep within 20 minutes. So they're back asleep at 3.15. And then they wake up for the day at 6.45 a.m. So this is an example of someone meeting that seven hour minimum requirement of sleep, as well as meeting um, good, good sleep quality in addition. But I think on a deeper level, it's more than just that. So good quality sleep is reflected within our brain waves during the night. And I have a little bit of a bias here because I, I was a sleep technologist. Um, I studied the brain waves uh, of the sleep EEG. So um, I, think, I think that um, like wearing a sleep device is not gonna capture these very minute changes in sleep quality. Um, and so I wanted to give you an example again of the primary study I worked on for my PhD was in smokers trying to quit. And during this study, this was one of the only studies we did where participants could consume caffeine at any point um, during the day. Usually we control very hard for that, but um, people who smoke often drink caffeine as well. So we wanted to keep that a part of the study. And I had one participant in particular who told me that actually coffee helps me fall asleep. It helps me, it helps my sleep quality. And I was kind of thinking to myself, eh, I don't know about that. And um, it just so happened that they were in the lab for three days. And on one of the days he did have a coffee right before bed. It was literally about 10 minutes before bed. And then one of the other days he didn't have that coffee. And when I looked at his EEG, I found huge changes in the differences between when he was drinking coffee and when he wasn't drinking coffee before bed. And it took him longer to fall asleep. He had twice as many awakenings during the night when he was drinking that coffee. And just overall, his um, brainwave activity was, he wasn't getting as deep of of sleep. So I think this is important also for people to keep in mind. You may think that certain things such as maybe electronic devices or caffeine doesn't really impact your sleep quality, but I think it really could be on a much more, if we looked at it in a much more fine-grained analysis. So one of the questions that came up was, um, is quality of sleep more important than quantity of sleep? So one of the myths out there is quantity of sleep is more important than quality. But when we look at the research, obviously it's the combination of quantity and quality as well as timing, which I'm gonna talk about. But um, I gave a presentation one time at the University of Calgary for some kinesiology students. And a gal came up to me after the talk and said, I'm pretty sure I have sleep apnea. I'm told that I stop breathing during the night. Should I be sleeping more to make up for all of the disruptions? And I told her, I think, I think this may help temporarily. So for example, adding in a nap could help her alertness levels you know, during the day. But um, bottom line that she would really need to see a sleep specialist to get the sleep apnea treated. So it's not just about the quantity of sleep that you're getting, but about the quality of sleep as well. So moving on to the last key, which is timing of sleep, we are going to put up a poll to see how, um, how we distribute as far as are you more of a morning type, are you more of an evening type? So go ahead and fill out that question here. Okay, let's see what those results are. Pretty evenly split here. So um, we see that the morning types, 60% oh, or so are um, more of a morning type than an evening type. And about 40% are more of that evening type. So I'm gonna talk 
I'm going to talk about that and how timing of sleep is also important. So um, when I'm talking about timing, I'm talking about the consistency of sleep is important. So the consistency of trying to go to bed and wake up at the same time is important for our circadian rhythms because we then our body knows when we should be awake and when we should be asleep. But there's also the chronotype that plays into this as well. So our biological preference for being more of that evening type or night owl versus the morning type or lark. So in the research, we see about 15% of us are morning types, true morning types where you go to bed early, you know, before 9 p.m., before 10 p.m., wake up before 6 a.m. And then about 15% of us are evening types, so going to bed midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., uh, waking up later. And then the rest of us kind of fall in between. So um, one, of, one of the key points is that we want to sleep more in line with our biology if we can. And I think during these times while we're at home, um, we have more flexibility to do that. And for myself, um, I think I've gravitated more towards being an evening type than I normally would if I was having to commute into work you know, I'm having to go to bed earlier, wake up earlier. But I think people should take advantage of the flexibility um, of not necessarily having to commute into work during these times right now. Although that's going to change soon, hopefully. An another myth is teens are lazy for wanting to sleep in. So I wanted to address that and actually know that's not the case. Their, their biology is telling them they're to go to bed later and wake up later. So their melatonin is being released later. So here we have a study looking at um, chronotypes. We're looking at more of the evening types up top, more of the early birds at the bottom, and then how this kind of changes across the lifespan. And what we see is for those teens is that you know, there's a peak in late evening types at around age 20, with males being more prone to be more of those evening types. But yeah, we start to see, you know, around 16 years of age to age 25-ish, we start to see more of the preference for being an evening type. So also during these times, um, you know, teens, I would allow my team to go to bed later and wake up later to be more in line with their biology. Okay, so we have the science of sleep summary here. So I went through a lot there, but uh, I just wanted to highlight these three main points. So sleep serves vital functions for both physical and mental health. We know that based on that video that you saw, sleep is regulated by sleep pressure and circadian rhythms. So sleep pressure being the longer you've been awake, the more likelihood you'll want to sleep. And then circadian rhythms is kind of our own cycle of alertness and drowsiness that's occurring. And then we also talked about quantity of sleep. So aiming to get a minimum of seven hours if you're an adult. Quality of sleep, so paying attention to that as well and then timing of sleep. So sleeping more in line with your biology if you can, as well as trying to keep those bedtimes and wake times consistent. So let's get into the fun part, the sleep tips. Um, and I'll try not to go through this too quickly, but I think I'm kind of running out of time here. But um, I think number one, uh, education is important. So you all are taking the first steps to educate yourself on the importance of sleep. And then I think try and take away this information and frame it in a way that kind of speaks to your language. So what I mean by that is for the athletes that I'm working with, a lot of them don't really care too much about health necessarily, but they're really interested in how sleep can help my performance. So for them, you know, we might want to frame it as sleep is a performance enhancer because that is kind of the language that they listen to. But for you, it may be something different related to mental or physical health. For teens, it may be that sleep helps them look good, which has been shown in the research. So really trying to frame that 
frame the information to the audience is important. And um, yeah, take some of those key, key concepts from today, frame it in your own language. And um, what we see when we're looking at sleep information sessions in general is in athletes at least, we see about a 20 minute increase in sleep duration per night after the athletes have, have been exposed to that sleep education. But we find that it's not maintained one month later. So I think coming up with ideas on how to make it an actionable individualized plan is really key for people to try and implement these, these tips. This was a plan I actually created for the a speed skater training for the Olympics. And um, what, what I did here was that I was trying to make an individualized plan and I think developing an app with this, which I am in the process of doing, um, is, is more useful, I think, than a piece of paper. But uh, we kind of kind of go with what we have here. But this particular individual, this is a speed skater in his uh, early 20s, needing about eight hours of sleep. So you mentioned he needs about eight hours of sleep to perform his best. So in this instance, um, I, I made him try and stay in bed for nine hours because of the time it takes him to fall asleep, the awakenings that might occur, and plus, you know, athletes in general probably need a little bit more sleep. So I was aiming for nine hours in bed for this particular athlete. And I took his latest wake, wake time. So he mentioned that he, the latest time he could wake up was 7.30 a.m. And then um, kind of worked my way backwards nine hours so that his bedtime would be 10.30 p.m. Of course, um, if this time was 8 p.m., you know, that's not going to be doable. So we may want to add in um, longer naps or something along those lines. So it has to be kind of a reasonable time that they could go to sleep. And then worked our way backwards an hour for a technology curfew, dimming the lights, trying to prepare for bedtime. And in this instance, we had blue, blue light blocking glasses, which I think can be useful um, for people who are working late at night. Um, to be able to eliminate some of that blue light, which we're really sensitive to, our circadian rhythms are very sensitive to. So we put in a, a blue, blue blocking glasses, when to wear those, and then also incorporated a 20 minute nap. And the schedule kind of changed a little bit on their days off. They had a longer opportunity to nap. So we put in a 90 minute nap on their days off. And what we found was that um, it's not about necessarily increasing the amount of sleep you're getting at night by an hour every single night. I think that sleep can accumulate across the week. So be cogniz cognizant of that and maybe add in naps if you can, or sleep in one day, no more than an hour and a half. You know, try and find times during the week where you can kind of make up for some lost sleep or really trying to optimize sleep. So for this individual, we, we, really, we told him, okay, let's try and get 30 minutes more per night of sleep, seven days a week. So that was three and a half hours across the week. We said, let's add in a 20 minute nap three times per week. So it was an hour. Let's add in that hour and a half nap one time per week. So it was an hour and a half. And then let's have you sleep in one hour um, per per week. And what we found was that it equated to uh, seven hours more of sleep per week. And that sounds daunting if you were to tell someone, let's get an hour more of sleep per night for every single day of the week. But I think, again, you can kind of piece it together throughout the week and incorporate naps, incorporate a little bit of sleeping in too. And can you create your own red X chart? So this is a little bit embarrassing and sorry, it's a little bit hard to read. But uh, for me, I would have the goal probably for the past two years is I wanted to learn R, which is a programming language uh, for analyzing data. And, you know, it was on my goal for two weeks or two years. And I would do it here and there, but it wasn't very consistent. And so I read about this story about Jerry Seinfeld who took a calendar and um, his goal was to create jokes every single day of the week. 
And so what he would do is he would write jokes and then he would cross the calendar off with a big red X. And I found that this technique really helped keep me accountable. And um, I've literally, over the past month, I've only missed maybe two days. And I try and make up for those two days. And the goal is to try and not, um, the goal is try not to miss two days in a row. So, you know, stuff happens, you're gonna miss a day here or there. Um, but try not to miss more than two days in a row. And I found that it really helped for me. Um, and I think you could use this tool for a goal related to sleep. So trying to get a minimum of seven hours of sleep per night, just grab Google 100 chart or use your calendar and cross it off every time you meet that goal. So banking sleep, um, many, I would say, a few sleep scientists out there don't really believe that you can make up for lost sleep. They don't think that you can really bank sleep. Uh, it may be a matter of semantics of, um, you know, recovering from sleep loss versus being able to actually store it in the bank. But there are a lot of studies show that banking sleep can lead to better performance, especially during a sleep deprivation period but as well as potentially an important competition. So uh, there's been some studies in uh, Stanford basketball players where they found that they were getting more sleep um, led to better free throw percentage, better reaction times. In this study by Swartz, they found um, improvement in tennis serving accuracy by 6%. In rugby players, they found uh, reduction or improvement in reaction time by 4% and a reduction in cortisol by 19%. So again, like what I did with the speed skater, trying to get more sleep leading into a sleep deprivation period. Maybe that's a night shift that you're working. Maybe that's a marathon that's coming up. Um, you know, you may not get a good night's sleep the night before the competition, but if you can bank more sleep in the one to two to three weeks prior to that event, um, it's gonna help you perform better during sleep loss. I think a pre-sleep routine is important and especially during these stressful times as well. So uh, I didn't put this in this slide, but I think it starts with a bedtime alarm. So have a goal for when you wanna go to bed and then set an alarm in your phone about an hour before that time to signify to turn off the electronic devices to start getting ready for bed and preparing your mind and body for sleep. So prepare for the next day. Uh, you could take a warm bath, uh, do relaxing activities. So write down three things you're grateful for, potentially a to-do list, stretching, read a paper book have all been shown to help, um, help you fall asleep quicker and improve sleep quality. And I am running out of time here, um, but I do want to talk about naps. I just have a couple more tips here. Um, benefits of naps, so huge benefits for naps. Reduce sleepiness, heightens alertness, increases concentration, boosts moods, enhances performance. I know in the video they mentioned napping, you know, may be a bad thing. But uh, I, I suggest that you keep the naps shorter. So, and, and time the naps earlier on. So trying to incorporate a less than 30 minute nap because then you're not getting into those deeper stages of sleep. Um, if you have a longer opportunity or if you slept really poorly the night before, maybe adding in a 90 minute nap where you don't set an alarm, maybe an emergency alarm. And for each of those naps, you wanna try and wake up naturally before the alarm and it just will make you more alert. And so timing that nap earlier is, is gonna be helpful at um, not uh, impacting your ability to fall asleep. Environment, cool, dark, and quiet, just like it would be for nighttime sleep as well. And then techniques to help fall asleep. So this is good for napping or during the middle of the night if you wake up or if, you know, if you're having a hard time falling asleep. These techniques are really useful. Writing a to-do list has been shown to help you fall asleep quicker versus um, just journaling about your day. And it offloads those thoughts off your mind so that you can you know, fall asleep more quickly. And then the 478 breathing, it activates that parasympathetic nervous system. Breathe in for four seconds, hold your breath for seven, breathe out for eight. 
uh, is a good technique. Do that four times and it'll activate that parasympathetic nervous system, that relaxation system. And then the cognitive shuffle, I really like. You think of a word such as bedtime. So, and then you imagine all the objects you can that start with B. So ball, baby, bag, bus. You move on to the next letter E, eagle, egg, ear. And by the time you get to the end of the word, you will be sound asleep. So that's a good one to try as well. And then I just have two more slides here on tips. So alcohol, it is a sedative. Um, it helps you fall asleep, but it does disrupt sleep, especially late in the night as it's being metabolized. And so this particular study was looking at a high number of drinks versus a lower amount of drinks versus no drinks at all. And what they found in this study, and again, this is kind of preliminary because it was an abstract in Sleep 2018, um, they found that lower number of drinks, so two drinks for men, one drink for women, was similar in sleep parameters as to no drinks at all. Um, for me, I find that even, even if I drink a glass of wine, let's say during dinner, I still feel as though it impacts my sleep quality because I'll wake up the next day groggier, I'll feel more tired. So I think there's a lot of variability in this. And so people just need to pay attention how it's impacting them and to just be aware that, um, you know, it does help you fall asleep quickly, but it does impair your sleep quality. And then caffeine, I'm a big uh, go decaf proponent. Um, I, I don't hate caffeine, I'm not you know, anti-caffeine, but I think uh, people need to use caffeine more strategically. And so in this particular study, they found 200 milligrams of caffeine at 7 a.m. led to um, poor sleep quality in habitual coffee drinkers who weren't drinking caffeine a couple of days before the study. So um, definitely can impact your sleep quality and make your sleep quality poorer. Um, in this study in athletes, they found 20% of super rugby athletes pulled all-nighters after consuming caffeine during an evening game. And you know, for some of you who may think the pre-workout with the caffeine is gonna help your evening um, training session, but to really be aware that it's probably impacting your sleep as well. And then just to be aware that um, how you metabolize caffeine impacts your ability to kind of get it out of your system and can um, affect how it impacts your performance. So in this particular study by Dr. Nancy Guess, they found that four milligrams of caffeine per kilogram during a, a cycling time trial actually impaired performance uh, by 14% in those that metabolize caffeine slowly. So um, it's not a universal caffeine cures everything and makes you do better. Um, it does, could depend on how you metabolize caffeine. And that's all I have. So um, just to summarize here, number one for sleep tips, educate yourself, frame it in a way that speaks to you. Uh, banking sleep is important as well uh, if you're leading into a sleep deprivation period or an important competition. Uh, napping, I am an advocate for, for those short naps early on in the afternoon. And then definitely monitor sleep and get help when needed. So if you are really struggling with your sleep, if you're um, you know, struggling with insomnia or you have, you're stopping breathing during the middle of the night, definitely seek help from a sleep professional and don't try to solve it on your own. And then having that pre-sleep routine will help prepare your mind and body for sleep. And then also just try and use alcohol and caffeine strategically. So sorry I went over a bit on time here, but I want to thank you for your attention. And um, I'll stick around for 10, 10, 15 minutes or so because I went a little bit overboard um, to answer any questions that you may have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett. That was fantastic. I think, I mean, it's always so informative. I always find like when you, when you start to learn about sleep, it kind of feels like the root system of a tree. Like you just don't even realize how many things it actually impacts, um, which is just
just, you know, my, my little nerd self thinks it's fascinating. So I think all of our, our listeners did as well. Um, I'll start tossing out some questions that have been popping up and I think we got some earlier. So um, let's start with one of the, a quick one, sleep devices. What are your thoughts and feelings on that? I saw somebody mention a whoop um, in the chat. I know I've got clients that come in that track their sleep and, and rely on that, um, whether it's their Fitbit, whatever it might be. Um, what is, what's your, what are your thoughts on, on sleep trackers? Yeah, I think, um, I think it depends on the person. So how you, how, what is a sleep tracker doing for you? So is it motivating you to get more sleep? Um, you know, then it may be useful in that situation, but there's a lot of people out there and I get a lot of questions on my device is telling me that I'm not getting enough deep sleep. Um, what should I do? And, you know, when I look at their sleep, they're doing everything perfectly. Um, so I think it, it's, there's a term or orthosomnia. So uh, these devices can create anxiety with your sleep and it can actually impact your performance. So if I'm working with an athlete and they're very anxious about their sleep, what's going to happen if they look at their device and they see that um, I had a terrible night's sleep last night and they have an important game coming up, you know? So personally, myself, I don't use sleep trackers for myself. I think just, I think they are useful in certain situations and they are becoming more accurate. Um, but yeah, I, I think people need to question um, why they're using it. Perfect. Yeah, and I think there is research being done, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, looking at devices and seeing if, if they are truly accurate, because I think that's an area that still uh, has a lot of room to grow. Definitely, yes, definitely. Um, yeah. The uh, Fitbit devices, there's Whoop devices, there's an Aura Ring. Uh, all of these are have validation studies, um, and they're all becoming better and better at you're welcome at, at you know measuring sleep. But they're still not quite there yet. Yeah, yeah, a little ways to go. Um, another question that popped up is uh, if you can talk to the effects of when you eat late at night. Um, and or exercise late at night and how that might impact the quality, quantity, timing, all that good stuff. Generally, as far as exercise goes, um, we don't find an impact on sleep generally unless it's very vigorous uh, exercise lasting of about an hour within two hours of bedtime. So if you're just kind of doing a moderate workout um, the research typically shows that it doesn't impact your sleep quality. Um, and there was an interesting study looking at the timing of exercise and how that impacts your cir circadian rhythm. And they found that early morning exercise helps shift your rhythm to an earlier time. So if you're more of a night owl, you may want to shift your exercise earlier on in the day to help kind of get you on more of a normal schedule. Um, and those who exercise in the afternoon, 5 p.m. or later, typically shifts your circadian rhythms to a later time. Um, so that's something to be aware of as it relates to circadian rhythms. As far as eating before bedtime, you want to try and avoid spicy, fatty meals, um, you know, three to four hours before bedtime if you can. And try and eat your dinner earlier on and then maybe supplement with a light snack before bedtime because, you know, when we're sleeping, we're meant to be resting, not digesting all of this food. Uh, and so that's why we wanna try and eat a little bit earlier if you can. I agree, as, as the dietitian, I'll second that. I think if we think about what's happening the second we lay down, the food that's now in our stomach has a greater chance of coming right back up because of gravity. So yes, as, as the dietitian, that's exactly what I tell them. And, and definitely to add on to that, um, there's more likelihood for uh, sleep apnea if you're eating closer to bedtime. So even in people who don't really have sleep apnea, um, if they're eating a big steak before bedtime, they're probably going to have more snoring, more stopping breathing, because all of that's kind of being sucked up to the airway, causing inflammation and making it harder to breathe. Perfect. 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 Um, another question is if you can talk about uh, supplements. I know I have a lot of clients that will come in with, 
you know, a bag of supplements and, and people who have, you know, trouble sleeping, like you mentioned at the very beginning is when you do have trouble sleeping, it becomes kind of bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, and so you end up investing in supplements that you think may be working or, you know, whatnot. Um, if you can speak to some supplements that you think are effective or some supplements that aren't or the dose. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, again, if you look at the, um, vitamin D research, it's mostly beneficial in those who are deficient. So, uh, for example, magnesium, if you look across the board, magnesium doesn't seem to have that big of an effect if you look at all of the studies that have studied this, unless the person has a deficiency. So, um, yeah, I think it depends on uh, whether or not they have a deficiency as to whether the supplement will work or not. I think um, tart cherry juice is kind of an up and coming supplement uh, which helps produce more melatonin and studies in insomniacs, or sorry, people with insomnia, um, they find improvements in the amount of sleep that they're getting, the ability to fall asleep. Um, and, you know, so tart cherry juice also can help with uh, inflammation as well. Uh, so that might be something for people to look into. Melatonin supplements, I'm not really a huge fan of unless you're using it for jet lag. So, and there's a lot of variability in what you're actually getting. So, you know, it's an unregulated substance and there's been studies to show that it's terrible, like what actually is in the bottle on certain brands. Um, so yeah, people need to, to watch out for that and, you know, try and get a good tested high quality brand if they're using melatonin for jet lag. Yeah. And melatonin is a tricky one. I think, again, everyone, I think people often think like the more, the better, and this is across the board with supplements. And, and as, aside from the fact that it may be contaminated with something, um, you know, more is not necessarily better. Um, do you want, do you know, like dosing wise, if on the rare occasion that you may have someone, what is your recommendation for jet lag, we'll say in particular? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the studies show 0.5 milligrams of melatonin helps shift your rhythms to, to an earlier time. So for example, if I'm traveling East, um, I might use some melatonin, uh, three days prior to departure to help shift my rhythm earlier. And I may use it at the destination as well. Um, uh, you know, maybe up to three milligrams, which can help create some somnolence, some, you know, being more tired. So I'd say you probably wouldn't want to go beyond three milligrams for melatonin. That's, that's exactly where I go with my athletes and that's at most. Um, yeah. And we have, we have a supplement out there that's called rested that is tart cherry um, and, and has magnesium in it as well. Um, at a very low dose because magnesium at a higher dose can act as a laxative. So just for people to be mindful of that. But yeah, tart cherry is a great, great source of naturally occurring melatonin, which is really mm -hmm. arguably the best source. Um, we'll finish up with one last question here, just to, since you've given us now way too much of your time. Um, and maybe, maybe a quick and easy one here, but um, is it essential to go to bed and wake up at the same time every single day? And if so, why? Yes. So there's been research to show um, they study people who have more of a consistent sleep schedule versus those who have more of an inconsistent sleep schedule with their sleep quantity being the same. So they're getting equal amounts of sleep, but one group goes to bed more inconsistently, another group goes to bed more regularly. And they find that um, mood is impaired when you're going to bed inconsistently. Um, you're, you know, you're at a higher likelihood for depression. And it's related to those circadian rhythms again, and um, your brain and your body knowing when it should be awake and when it should be asleep. And so, yeah, the research is showing more consistent sleep schedules are better for overall health. Um, I'm a bit more lenient, so I don't know. I, I, I like to go by the 80-20 rule a little bit, even though that's not um, necessarily tested within sleep science. But um, I don't think people should despair if 
they go to bed at 11.30 one night when their normal bedtime is at 10 p.m. Um, you just wanna kind of limit that to maybe one day a week, two days a week. And I will say that um, waking up is actually more important than going to bed at a different time. So keeping your wake up time consistent is more important than variating vari variation in your bedtime. Um, and so, for example, if I get a poor night's sleep, I'm not going to try and sleep in two hours because it then might impact my process S and my ability to fall asleep that night. I'm going to try and limit it to about an hour and um, maybe take a nap if I need to supplement from that poor night's sleep. So if people have a choice, obviously uh, try and keep that wake up time anchored as as close as you can and try not to vary that by more than 90 minutes so 90 minutes is kind of that sweet spot any anything above and we start to see really poor uh, health outcomes awesome well i did not know that so i learned something new every day which is awesome well um dr Bender, thank you so much really really appreciate you taking time to educate all of us on the importance of sleep and the impact of sleep um, really can't tell you how thankful we are. Um, everyone, thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it. We will be sending out a follow-up email with an eval for Dr. Bender. If you can take some time to say thank you by just filling out the evaluation, that would be great. We would hugely appreciate it. Uh, we will be back with more, so stay tuned. Um, and follow her on that Twitter handle. It's uh, a bunch of information that you will get. So thanks again, guys, and we will see you all soon. Thanks for having me.